So the uh, Sega LED board we looked at in a previous video reminded me that I had these boards. I picked these up on eBay easily over a decade ago. Uh, what caught my eye on these was the National Semiconductor logo. Hopefully you can see it here. I worked for National Semiconductor from 1980 to 1994 in various roles. I was hired as an electronics tech and when I uh, left National to go work for Intel, I was a, a functional and parametric test engineer, uh, doing a lot of programming for data analytics, uh, process control kind of stuff, uh, database work. We brought in a relational database, Sybase. Uh, just you know, a ton of different experience I got at National. It's been invaluable in my career after. Anyhow, the National Semiconductor logo caught my eye. It's an interesting little board. There was, I believe, five of them that I bought. They were pretty inexpensive. So I thought we'd reverse engineer one of these and kind of figure out what we have. Uh, so on this first board, I've popped out the a couple of the seven-segment displays. They're probably about one inch high. They're a big display. There's no part numbers on the display, which I found interesting. Uh, I don't know how well it shows up on camera. But there's a lot of inconsistency looking through the little light pipes. This one's really kind of white. This one's dark. This one's lighter. There's a lot of inconsistency across them, which I found kind of interesting. The pins on them are, have either been soldered, dipped, or were soldered in something at one time and removed. It's hard to say. I'm sure you can't see it, but down written in pencil it looks like inside of here. This one says 13 slash 45. I'm guessing it's kind of hard to read. This one looks like it says 2 slash maybe 46. And I'm sure underneath all of these I'm going to find a similar thing. No part number and some kind of a handwritten That might be 12 of 36 or 10 of, I mean, 10, 12 of 45 or 10 of 35, or maybe it even says 10, 6, 4, 5. It's really hard to say. Uh, these may well be prototype displays or early production displays. Uh, National, I'm very sure, made. LEDs and LEDs displays at the time. The factory I worked in in West Jordan, Utah, we made EEPROMs, uh, along with some automotive stuff, if I remember right. Uh, I worked on the 2708 through the 27C256 uh, EEPROMs. Uh, we were a 4-inch factory when I came in, a 6-inch fab in the end. We got down to 0.6 micron back in the time. Uh, did a lot of work with EEPROMs. Characterized very CPROM programs, that kind of stuff. Anyhow, that's tangential to, to what we're talking about here. So I don't know, I just found these boards interesting because of the national logo. And then when I got them and popped a couple of displays off, it was like, wow, those are uh, really interesting. To approach reverse engineering this board, the first thing was a, a really good visual inspection. Take a look at the board, understand kind of the layout. Uh, there's uh, CD4511s here, and when I went and found the data sheet for the CD4511, it's a CMOS BCD to 7 segment latch with the coder driver, so you can take a BCD value, latch it into this IC, and it'll decode it and drive a 7 segment display. So those make perfect sense. There's six displays and there's six of these chips. So we can already tell from that that each one of these drivers drives one of the seven segment displays. So we know this isn't a multiplex display. The other hint that it's not multiplex is we don't see a lot of parallel lines between the seven segment displays here. If they were multiplexed where you were lighting up one display at a time in sequence, there'd be a lot of common pins and there just aren't. So there's an individual drive channel, it looks like, for each one of the displays. These latching BCD to seven segment display drivers, but that then brought into question, what is this chip here? And the number on it uh, wasn't really an IC number, even though it's in a 14-pin dip package. And I'll try to read what's labeled on here. It looks like it says R107-56N. 
Uh, the R is a good hint that it's a resistor network. It's really common with seven segment displays to have a resistor for current limiting for each one of the segments. So I, I thought at that point, odds were really good. This is a, a resistor network. Grab the handy ohm meter and just did a bit of poking around on these. And what I discover is like from pin one to 14 here, there was a 55.7 ohm resistor. There's another, this one's 55.8 ohm, all the way up to there's a resistor up here at 56.3 ohm. So I'm guessing the dash 56N is just indicating these are 56 ohm resistor packs. So not ICs, they may be a thin, thin film resistor or, or some such thing. But just from this we can tell there's a LED display driver, there's current limiting resistors. So we already have a pretty good idea of what each one of these columns here are. Other thing I did was take a good look at the edge connectors. This is labeled, let me flip it around here so that it, it's upright on the camera, hopefully you can see it. Labeled plus five on these two pins and ground on these three pins. And it's the same thing on the back, although these pins aren't connected. They're just there. Again, it's labeled ground on this side and plus five on this side. So that gives, you know, there's T, uh, the, let me step down here. There's some TTL logic here as well. There's a 74LS138 and an 81LS95. Uh, this is definitely a TTL device. This is a TTL device as well. TTL devices run off plus five volts. We have plus five volts. It makes sense. Um, the other thing that I noticed is on this edge connector here, all of these traces are connected together on this side. And the odds are really good. Those are all just ground as well. And of course the ohm meter shows me that, you know, there's zero ohms there, that it's ground. So we have a power input connector. We have a bunch of grounds on this side. And we have 13 I.O. pins, or probably just input pins on this side. So mechanically it starts to make sense. I've got power input, I've got pin 1 is ground, 2 is a data signal, 3 is ground, 4 is a data signal. So I've got my data inputs here. Uh, there's this interesting little block here where there's these four solder pads. And on this side they're all hooked together. Each one of these goes to a trace. And there's a jumper link installed here. And so that gives me a hint that this board is somewhat addressable. You could have it in multiple positions uh, and you could use the proper jumper leak to program the board for which one of the positions it was going to be in. So you know the interface gets kind of simpler and simpler here. Looking at data sheets again. The 81LS95 is a three-state octal buffer. So basically what it does is you have a set of inputs on these A pins and a set of outputs on the Y pin. So A1 is an input, Y1 is an output. There's an enable pin that enables the data to be passed through, a couple of them. And so all this is a bus buffer that takes the signals coming in here, buffers them so that they are buffered and can drive the logic downstream on the board. The 74LS138 is a one of eight decoder demultiplexer. It's got three address pin inputs here and multiple outputs, output zero to output six. And basically what happens is if you put zero, zero, zero on here and enable, you'll get output zero to go low. If you put in a, uh, in this case, a zero, zero, one, you can get output one, do I believe, go low. I believe these drive the outputs low. It might drive them high. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're knotted up here, so they're active low outputs. So anyhow, you can, by putting three bits in as an address, remember three bits can represent 000, 000 to 111, which gives you 0 through 7 decimal. And there's seven outputs, 0 to 6 here, actually 7. And on the pin out of the device, output 7 and outputs. So you can select any one of these outputs independently. The odds are really good that that's being used to select which one of the LEDs I want to talk to. Because these devices latch, my presumption on the design of this board is from the edge connector, I can input three signals 
again on the data side I can input three pins to say which one of the six I, this displays I want to talk to I can put in the BCD value that goes into the seven segment display driver uh, and then I can send a latch signal that's gated somehow probably through the LS138 and pulses the latch pin on whichever device is selected and latches its BCD value. So it gives you a pretty simple interface here overall. Again, board position select, I assume. Uh, there's going to need to be three pins for the uh, 74 LS 138 to select which display we're going to go to. There's going to be four pins that provide the BCD value. It's going to get decoded to the 7 segment display. And, a, and probably a latch pin or two on here. So like I say, I spent some time, looked at this board, uh, looked at the data sheets for the parts, and, and got an idea, really, at, at this, you know, this 10,000 foot view of how this board must operate. From that, I then proceeded to fire up just Windows Paint. Uh, down, had downloaded the data sheets. I used the uh, snippet tool in Windows to snip from the data sheets the package outlines and just kind of created a representation of the board here just directly in paint. Drew out some 7 summit displays. We know there's those resistor networks. We know these 4511s do the BCD decoding to 7 segment drive. I'm not going to bother to draw in the schematic here, the wiring here. We know that the ABCD etc. outputs here go through resistors to these displays. These displays are going to be on a common uh, ground or a common v VCC connection. I don't know if these are common analog or common cathode. I really don't care. But what we kind of have surmised at this point is this. I've taken this edge connector here and I've represented it by just drawing this block. So there's a, an indexing slot here in the edge connector that I've indicated with the black line here. There's this little group of eight pins that I've represented here. And all I'm going to do at this point is take the things I can actually see and start to draw them onto kind of my paper schematic here. So hopefully this will show up on camera. We already know just by looking at the traces here, and actually I can already see a mistake. These don't exist. Those connector blocks are actually up here. That pin, pin 26, goes nowhere. So, these are connected this way. These are all connected together and go off to some place in the circuit and there's a little jumper here. So we've already captured that piece of it. We can also follow the trace here. And we can see that that goes to, one more time to make sure, it goes up to, looks like the 74LS138 on pin, that's 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. On the 74LS138, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense at the moment. We have that pin comes up, ah, see I traced it incorrectly, dealing with the light. That trace comes up to this via. That via comes through the board to there and goes off to the device. So let's get the uh, continuity checker out here. Let's see if we can figure out which pin that actually goes to. So it comes up to this via, and it looks like it travels over to this side of the IC. And we can hear, you know, via the continuity here on the meter, that it's going to that pin right there. That's four pins down from this side. One, two, three, four, five. So that's pin five on the device. Pin five is an able three. I'm sure you can't see the text very well here on the sheet. There's three enable pins on that LS138. Let's find the uh, schematic here. There's three enable pins, enable one, enable two, enable three. This looks like it's going to enable two. Eight, enable two is knotted, so it enables with that signal low. 
So we already know at this point, and I of course drew that in the wrong place, on pin 5, we already know that this signal comes over here to this enable pin. Let me clean that up, draw that a little cleaner. Trying not to get my head between the camera and what I'm drawing. So we know that these, pin, you know, the, these pins here, I'm almost guaranteed it's, it's going one of these is going to be taken low to select the device. Uh, I don't see a pull-up resistor any place on that, which says to me this is just being driven by, you know, not not by, by like an open collector driver, but by a, lo a, a logic level driver that's driving this, you know, the, the plus five or ground or, uh, you know, approximately that the TTL levels. So we've already figured out what one pin group of pins here does, and I'm just going to work through the traces on the back side because that's really the easiest to follow and start to follow those through. So I'm going to go to pin 2 up here and pin 2 goes to that pin right there on the uh, buffer. That's So that's pin 8 on the buffer. Again, am I counting wrong here? Because again, what I saw there was an output 1098 1098 oh no that's an input so that's the A4 input so we know that pin 2 here goes to there so something I tried to do when I drew kind of this worksheet up was I tried to leave lots of white space here uh, so I had lots of places to, to go in and draw with pencil lines. It would have probably been better for you had I made these larger, they'd be easier to read. But I needed room to be able to get in here with the pencil and draw, and maybe positioning him closer to center would have been good as well. Obviously I didn't do that. Let's go on to pin 4, and trace where pin 4 goes, and it looks like it goes to 5 pins down. So that's one, two, three, four, five. That's pin six. Pin six is this pin right here. So we know that pin four goes to pin six. So this is already starting to make sense. We have incoming signals here to the inputs on the 81 LS95. Let's move on to pin six. Again, I'm, and that looks to go to pin two. Which is another input. Let's go on to pin eight. And that looks like it goes to pin four. So we have four, we know, inputs here going to four inputs on the bus buffer. Let's go to pin 10, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Goes to that pin there. So this is pin 1, it's square. So we have 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Goes to pin 8. So pin 16 on the device here. Going to pin eight. So as I'm drawing these connector lines in, I'm also trying to leave lots of white space here, so I don't have to erase and move lines around because it gets too crowded. So again, that's just kind of thinking ahead. Uh, hopefully, at this point, you've already captured the fact that some planning and thought ahead of time makes reverse engineering something like this easier. You know, this is a pretty simple board, but even it's taking a bit of thought to get through. Come to the other side of the gap here, which, which should be pin 12, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. 
and that trace runs to pin 18 so we're going to bring this over to and again you know it's just starting to look kind of cluttered but that's what always happens so that pin goes to pin 18 so we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, we've got 14 which looks like it comes up to 11, 12, 13, 14 I'm drawing this it's pretty much standard schematic drawing where if I had two lines in the schematic a dot like that would indicate that wire is connected there and it's not connected there so you notice I'm there's no connector dots being drawn any place here and that's because none of those are connected together so if I discovered there was a connection like that I would go in and use the dot to indicate that was a connection. So I know there's no connection there or there or there on, on those intersections. And we're really down to one last pin, and that's pin 16, and I'm guessing that's going to come to A5 here. That's about the only place it could go. And that comes and goes to pin 12, and pin 12 is right here. Go ahead and bring this signal down around the uh, the uh, little bit of the OCD in me requires me to redraw that to be pretty straight. So what we've basically determined here is there are eight inputs here which are going off to the eight inputs of the bus driver here. There's some kind of an enable that gets passed to one of the pins on the LS138. And we basically captured at this point all of the inputs here. Now it becomes how is this connected to this. And the easiest way I think to determine this is simply going to be by doing this. I'm going to take this is really tiny you're not going to be able to see it. I've actually kind of redrawn it here in the schematic. Hopefully this will somewhat show up. I've got that 75 or that, that 4511 here and it's got four inputs for the BCD inputs D1, D2, D3, and D0. And odds are really good those are going to come from four of the pins on this device. So I'm really just going to go in. I'm going to go to pin Seven here. So pin seven. And apologies, this isn't easier to see. Oh, of course, things have got to grab. Pin seven is the A input. I'm going to start with the A input. So that's going to be pin seven. We've already found it. So pin seven, right here, goes to pin three on this buffer. So I'm going to go ahead and bring these pins out. Again, I didn't draw this super well. It's already starting to get very cluttered, but that's kind of expected. Actually, 
shouldn't be brought out. That's I went to pin one, and pin one is a G, is the G1 pin, which is an enable pin on the buffer. So let's just clean that line out of there. We have this pin. Which comes out. I can already see I'm not going to have enough room drawn that way. And we have this pin that comes out. get some lines started here so we've got the four inputs coming in and four outputs coming out and we just determined and let's redo that because I've forgotten the pin but pin 7 which is the A input of the LED driver goes to pin 3 off here so we know that this pin and this pin are connected together let me transfer the line across. Pin 3 comes down here. So we already know, and remember I started with A here, so the A of the BCD value is the Y1 output. So we know that this is A. That's where the A input of the BCD value comes in. Now let's go find B here. We can see that the B input or data one is on pin one. And let's just walk across again. And it's there on pin one, two, three, four, five. So pin five, pin five is the second trace. Transfer it across and connect it. Should probably have a little ruler here. We know the C input or D2 is on pin 2. Which is right there. And it's on pin, what is that, 7? Seven? 7 is Y3. See, this is already making good logical sense. Never did the layout. So let's trace this back again. We said the B input was on A, Y2, so A2 is B. B is sitting right there. We've just said the C input comes off Y3, which is the A3 input, that's C, and we can be very sure here, although we'll, we'll ohm it out, that the D input or D3 is coming from right there. But let's go ahead and prove that. So the D input is pin 6, and we'll just, and we believe that's going to come from pin 9 and it, and it does so that makes logical sense now the odds are really good here matter of fact I already know this to be true if I go to pin 1 which is this D1 input here all of these pin 1's are going to be tied together for all the 45 11's and they are. And if I look at pin 2 for the data 2, again, they're all going to be tied together. Go to pin 7, we'll see the same thing. And if I go to pin 8, actually it was pin 6, here's pin 7. So what that's telling me is, and I guess I could draw, well I'm not going to draw this in, pin 1 on this stack is connected directly to pin 1 here. So these ABCD inputs 
are tied to all these devices in parallel. Actually, write this in. D is right here. So, you know, I know that pin 1 here goes to pin 1 here, and pin 2 here goes to pin 2 here, and pin 1 here, all the pin 1s are connected together. So this is one of the reasons there's a bus buffer in here. So what's happening, let's go ahead and just grab a piece of paper and draw that out. Just so you can understand what I'm explaining here. Is we have the card edge connector pin here, and someplace out here, and some other piece of electronics coming to an edge connector is some kind of a probably TTL driver. And I'm just going to, you know, maybe it's a 7404 driver. And that's coming, so this is the edge connector here on the board. That's coming into the active electronics on the board, and it's going to one of the drivers in this bus buffer. And that driver's coming out, and now we have six, in this case 4511's here, and that's driving all six of these. So it's driving a pin on all six. So we have a what's called a fan out here, where this output's fanned out to six inputs on, again, these, these you know, LED drivers, these 4511's. And so if this was just connected straight through from the edge connector to the 6, you would be putting the drive required for that fan out on whatever's driving this on this side. And you really don't want to do that. Uh, each one of these takes some amount of current. The C or 0 or is it C and 1. And you don't want to assume that whatever's out here in the world connected to the edge connector can provide enough drive to be able to drive those high or low. So instead, you bring those signals from the edge connector into a buffer, that buffer in case is this 81LS95, and then you do your fan out. And that way you're really only saying there's one TTL load here. TTL load are referring to the input of a TTL device. So that's what's going on here. This buffer is being used to control a, a, a single input fanned out to multiple outputs. This bus buffer is capable of driving higher currents than you know, you know, a typical single TTL output can drive. So that's why this buffer exists here, is, is to manage that fan out and not require high drive currents driving into the inputs here on the edge connector. So as you can see, we've already made really good progress here. We know where the BCD incoming values are. We know the pinouts of the BCD values. Again, BCD. Uh, if you, and maybe I should explain BCD a bit here. The seven segment display is capable of displaying the digits zero through nine. BCD is binary coded decimal. How BCD is used is actually pretty, pretty, it's an easy concept once you get it. Hopefully you're familiar with binary. And binary, of course, this will count up, 0, 0, 1, 0, all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1. What BCD does is exactly what you'd expect here. All zeros means the, the value is zero. The value is one. The value is two. In BCD, you actually stop at a binary nine. So in BCD, you're not going to care about the A, B, C, D, E, F outputs. And what this allows you to do is take, say, a single byte in the computer. So we'll draw a byte out here. Uh, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I've got a single byte in the computer of memory, and I'm going to say that's BCD encoded. And what that means is these four bits here become one BCD set, and these four bits here become another BCD set. So we know this position in BCD can represent these four bits, the values from 0 to 9. 
we know the same thing is true for this group of four bits. And so binary coded decimal is a way of basically having the value of 0 to 9 here, 0 to 9 here. So if I had a binary coded value of 99, I would have 1001 here and 1001 here. And of course you can extend this out. So it's just kind of an easy way of a binary coded decimal. It's representing the decimal value in the bit fields. You know, 0 to 9, 0 to 9, 0 to 9, 0 to 9 in a binary way, and it makes doing things like this pretty simple. Uh, and, uh, one of my previous videos, actually a few of them, we've talked about the PIC32 series and the RTCC clock. And the RTCC, the real-time clock calendar, has registers inside, and those registers are storing the time and the date as BCD encoded values. So, you, you know, it's common. Uh, it, it, you know, in this case, we're only using four bits here. But if we were, you know, if we were inputting more values in BCD, it's just easier than taking, you know, 99 in binary. Can I do it in my head here? 64, 32. That's 96. Two, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. Does that give me? 64, 94, 96, 97, 8. So in binary, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. I believe that's a binary 99. Uh, 128, so 64, 32, 0, 0, 0. Whereas in BCD to represent that 99, we have 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. So you can see here, this is BCD and this is binary. You can see here that this just is easier to look at. I can look at that and go a 1001 is a 9, a 1001 is a 9. Whereas represented in binary here, I would have to decode that back out to get to uh, something that's easier to decode such as this. So it, it makes it make your logic easier because these devices expect a, a, a BCD coded input. It can make things easier to deal with in the computer and in the physical electronics. Anyhow, sorry for the kind of the off on a tangent there. Hopefully, maybe that made some sense and helped a few people. Uh, now, the other thing that we know here is we've accounted for four of these inputs, and we have four more that we need to look at. And I'm confident already that three of these four remaining ones are going to come to this A0, A1, and A2, depends on the 138. A0, A1, and A2 are the inputs to the 138 that are used to select which output's going to be active. So we should be able to come back right to the electronics here. Let's take one of the outputs that we haven't decoded here yet. We'll take pin 11. So pin 11 sitting right here. And we already found it. Pin 11 goes to pin 1 on the 138. So if we take pin 11 out, it's going to come to A0 here. Pin 11's input is pin 12. So we now know that this is A0. If we then take the pin 13 output, of the 130, or of the, uh, I'm sure I'm doing this right now, it's pin 11, went to there, pin 12, pin 13, just as I thought, goes to A2. I mean, that's logical, that's how I would have done it had I been the designer of the schematic, just because it's logical. So that pin's coming to A2. Odds are really good this pin 15 here is going to go to A3. We'll find out. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Does that come to A3? And it does. Again, that's very logical. Let's bring that down and draw it in. So we've identified the address inputs here. So we know that A2 is on 13 here. And it's the input for that is 14. And if we trace this around, Actually, I said A2, I meant A1. We know that the A1 input is right there. 
Now if we take the A2 input, it goes to 15. That's the output of the buffer. The input for the buffer is labeled A7 there. And if we bring that around, that's interesting. That puts A2 right there. I would have actually expected it to be on pin 12 here, but apparently it's not. That, that's interesting. I want to confirm that. So let's go back to pin 3 here, which is A2. We said A2 is connected to pin 15 here. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And then we said, so that's 15 and 16. 11, well, I'm going to trust what I drew over here was correct. So A2 goes to 15, 16, wraps around to A2 there. So we know that the three address inputs to the demultiplexer are labeled there A0, A1, and A2. So we still have the question of what this undefined input here is. 12 goes off to pin 18. And 17 is the output. So the question becomes, can we figure out where that signal goes to? One way to do that is to actually look physically at the device. 20, 19, 18, 17. There's no trace on this side. 19, 18, 17. There's no trace I can see on this side either. It maybe it goes nowhere, although it, it's hard to say absolutely. So I'm just going to kind of randomly poke around here. 20, 19, 18, 17. 17 is the pin I'm looking for, right? Yep. 20, 19, 18, 17. Oh, it does. So it comes to pin four, the 138. Pin 4 is an enable on the 138. So that's interesting. And of course with 17 is the output, 18 is the input. 18 comes back around to the undefined pin here that ultimately is going to pin 4 of the 138. Pin 4 is the enable 1 input. Let's look at the data sheet. That's the wrong data sheet. The enable 1 input is also an active low. So this is going to enable 1, not and we had determined, see, enable one and two are both, I'm going to knot these here in the schematic just to make it easy. And we see that enable two goes to this bank down here. This goes to enable two knot. So what this is telling me is to enable this device, both these pins need to be brought low. And again, that's interesting because that kind of says, we have kind of a gross bank select here, and then we have an enable on that pin 12 and the MUX addressing on the 0, 1, and 2. So that's interesting. <coughs> so we've got, I've got a pretty good idea here of what would have to happen. I'm going to put the BCD value on these four pins here. I'm going to put the address of the display I want, 0 to 6, on the A2, A1, and A0, and I'm probably just going to pulse these two pins low, and that will enable and latch it. There might be a bit of a timing requirement on those, I don't know. So the next question this becomes is I have the LS138, I'm off camera here, I'm sorry, the LS138, which pins on it go to which 77 displays? So I, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, the mounting for these displays, the decimal points in the bottom uh, left hand corner here. So I'm assuming the board would be mounted in this orientation and this would be the top of the display and this would be the bottom. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to label this left hand and this right hand. 
And so this guy represents this digit, this guy represents this digit. So let's figure out now on the 138 which output pins go to which one of the 4511, 4511s. So and what I'm going to look for, I'm going to guess is the latch input. So there's an LE pin, LE slash strobe. So I'm going to guess LE strobe is the pin that you actually pulse the latch. And the little block diagram here kind of confirms that to me. As LE slash strobe comes to the block that's labeled latch, there's an LT and a BL pin here. BL is probably zero blanking. I'm not sure what LT is. I didn't print the whole. Okay, LT is lamp test. Okay, so LT is lamp test. Taking that pin low will light all seven segments up. Blanking is just what I said, is a blanking input, and that's usually used for zero blanking, so that if you have zeros going off in the left direction on the displays, they're not actually displayed. And latch enabler strobe uh, latches it in. So we know the strobe is on pin five. So all I'm going to do here is go to what I designated as the left hand display. I'm going to go to pin 5 and I'm going to look at the outputs on the 138 and that's on output pin 10 which is labeled output 5. So this output Looks like it goes to that latch there. And that output is the output 5 pin and almost guaranteed, just based on laying this out logically, that's going to come to pin 11. Nine, ten, eleven, to pin twelve, to pin thirteen, to pin fourteen, and to pin fifteen. So that, that just makes sense. So output zero is this latch enable. Get out here and kind of draw this in the center. Latch enable here is going to be this pin. Latch enable here is going to be this pin. Latch enable here. Will be this pin. And latch enable here. So what this determines for me is for the output 0 to be active, A0, A1, and A2 have to be zeros. So let me clean this up a little bit and we'll make a little chart here. This is the right hand side, this is the left hand side, and I'm going to put in A2, A1, A0. So for this one to be selected, those are going to be values of 0, 0, 0. And again, I'm sorry if I'm off screen here. Apologies. I'm trying to stay inside of the blue tape. doesn't always work. So what I'm doing here is trying to determine on these A0, A1, A2 inputs, which display is actually being driven or being talked to, which latch. We've determined that the output 0 goes to this right-hand display over here. So we know what those all zeros. Uh, Output one goes to output one goes to this display, so that's going to be zero zero one zero one zero zero one 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 zero zero and one zero one. So that's zero one two three four five.
output 5 comes to here. So, you, you know, we, we pretty much captured the schematic at this point. Uh, I need to figure out what's happening with Enable 3. Uh, I'm not sure what it would be being... You know, we've consumed all the pins on the buffer. Enable 3 is an active high on pin 6. It may just be tied to VCC. Enable 3 is, as I just said, pin 6. It's not tied to VCC. Is it tied to anything? And this is going to get interesting. That pin's not tied. Is there a resistor pull up? Get to the plus 5 rail over here. 653.2 ohms to VCC. That's a 10k ohm resistor, so that's not a resistor pull up there. That's strange. So, am I seeing the internal pull up in the device? That seems low for that 653 ohms. That would certainly pull it high. What do I see if I had to ground 1.8k? That's kind of a mystery. Uh, Lighting in here is not really good enough to see if there's a... There's no trace off pin 6 on the back side, which of course makes it even more difficult. I'm pretty sure I'm seeing a trace up under there that's coming off. It would be that lead there. There's an, there is a via there. Is that via there, if I can get continuity to it, go to that pin? It does. Okay, I know this is hard to see. So there's a trace on the board that comes from pin 6, it becomes this lead here, and I can just see a pad of a via underneath this device and when I got in there on that via and pin 6 I can see that it drops through to right here so pin 6 uh, make sure my orientation's right pin 6 is going to be this pin and it's going to come to this via right here that lead comes down and goes to oh interesting goes to pin one two three four on one of these drivers pin four is blanking that's really interesting that this gets tied to blanking? How does that make any sense? Pin 6, pin 4. Is blanking an output? That only makes sense of blanking as an output, which I don't think it is. No, blanking as an input. E2 is an input. Is it pulled up someplace? Okay, so that 
answers it or does it. It's pin five, one, two, three, four, five. I thought we just, oh, six, sorry. So, pin six, hopefully this is in camera, pin six is tied to the blanking input here, the blanking input, all these blanking inputs are in parallel, and it appears to go to this side of this resistor, I mean that's continuity, and the other side of that resistor goes to plus five, so what's happening here? It's kind of what I guessed it should have been. Is this enable three? It's simply pulled high as it should be. And that's a brown, black, orange resistor. That's 10K. And this also comes to what I'm going to label A here. And all of these blanking inputs are also tied to A. So the blanking inputs are pulled high on all of the oops, 7 segment display drivers. So they're not going to blank. They're always going to display leading zeros. Make sure that's drawn as connected. And that really makes sense. So that single 10K ohm resistor there, which is simply a pull up resistor, all the pull up resistor does is take a floating input such as these inputs are. All of these, the BL pins and that E pin are, are inputs. And if they weren't connected to anything, they'd float, which just means there's nothing driving them. And in logic systems, floating pins can oscillate. They can react to pins around them. They can create random behavior. So essentially, you terminate them. Uh, you either tie them to ground, tie them to VCC, or the more traditional ones to use a pull-up resistor, and all the resistor is doing here, a pull-up, is ensuring this pin stays basically at a 5 volt potential. If you tied it directly to 5 volts, you would have increased current flow. So if I had tied all seven of these pins directly to the 5 volt rail, there would be a fair amount of current flow to those inputs. Uh, that really is just wasted energy. Instead, we go through a 10K ohm resistor. That limits the current. It doesn't take a lot of current to hold them high. And just holds them high. So I think we actually have a pretty complete schematic here of what the board looks like. So I don't know if I mentioned this earlier in the video. I think you can probably tell from some of my other videos I have a bit of a, I'll call it a clock fetish. I do like making clocks. They're useful. You know, they're, they're fairly simple to engineer. They occupy the mind. The original intent when I bought these boards was to, to basically, I think I got six of them or five, was to make clocks out of them. And because there were six displays, it was like, ah, oh, clock, hours, minutes, and seconds. The kind of the vision I had was to have this board in some kind of a frame where maybe there's an inch of clearance all the way around. The edge connectors are just exposed as they are here. You know, there's no card edge connector slid on. So the board just seems to be suspended there in the case, and yet it's active and working. And this board design actually lays itself out well for this, because I could make logic and power connections on the back of the board that would be hidden in the display case. Uh, to drive this with just, you know, a, a, a pretty simple pick processor would be enough to drive this. Uh, use an external RTCC module on it. And these could be turned into, I think, clocks fairly easily. And it really just becomes you know, translating uh, the internal you know, representation of the clock the time to the proper drive signals here. And it really does look to me, so let me find a latch. So my guess here, uh, something we haven't determined yet that we should, schematic's not complete, is what gates on and off these buffers. That's actually going to tell me a bit more about what I need to know here. So this buffer pin 2 is, a, is an enable for it and it's not tied to ground. And 
pin 19. I suspect that one's tied to ground. Okay, so 19 is tied to ground. I guess that just because of the width. The, the, the power bus here is the wider width. So we know, based on that, that 19 is simply tied to ground. What we don't know is where pin 1 goes, and hopefully... No, shoot, there's no trace on that side. It looks like there is a trace up under the board. And it looked like a fairly heavy trace. Oh, I just didn't buzz it out well. So, pin 1 is also grounded. Uh, did not leave myself a lot of room to draw this in. So the enables for the 81LS95 are both grounded, so it's always active. It's taking the inputs and driving the outputs, which is fine. We have an enable input here that comes from that's E1 it comes from here and we have a bank select so if I was to drive this board grab a piece of paper here and we'll talk a bit about my thoughts on driving this board I've got the four BCD inputs and I'm going to actually lay them out a, B, C, D. And I'll go ahead and put the pin numbers in. A is on pin 6 of the edge connector. B is on pin 8 of the edge connector. C is on pin 4 of the edge connector. And D is on pin 2 of the edge connector. So I would, from least significant to most significant, I would put the BCD values there. I would then take A0, A1, A2, A0, A1, A2, and draw the A's in to make those just easier to follow. And I would bring those to these, nah, that looks horrible, sorry. A0, A1, a2, A0 is on pin 16, A1 is on pin 14, and A2 is on pin 10. So I would make these next three bits here the position set of bits, and there's an enable 1, and I would put enable 1 up here probably on the most significant bit, which is on pin 12. So I'm going to partition this out this way. And so if I wanted to display the BCD value 4, there's a BCD value 4. On display 4 here, or on display 2 here, what I would do is I would output that value, so I'd, I'd use a single byte output on the pick. This again is the least significant to the most significant bits. Change that up a bit. I would output that bit pattern. Give it a, a, you know, a microsecond or whatever to stabilize. I would then simply change that most significant bit to a zero. I mean, guess make all the zeros Danish to zeros so they're consistent. I would then set that bit back to a, a 1. And what by taking this most significant bit and creating a pulse with it and holding these other bits stationary, what I've done is output the address and the BCD value. So display number 2, or display number 2 to display the value 4. Let that stabilize for a bit, create a pulse on this enable one pin that enable one pin
enables the LS138. And where does the latch enable come from exactly? So by putting that pulse on the most significant bit that enables this device, this device has the 010 on the inputs. It takes the output here for two. That output gets pulsed low also, a one to a zero to a one. That latch enable pulse comes through actually to here and we've latched that value to there. So basically, you know, that's how I will drive this. I can output the BCD value I want on these four bits, the address of the display I want from 000 to 101. So again, that's, you know, 012345. And I can use the most significant bit simply to generate the clock signal or the latch signal to latch it in. I think that's all it will take to actually drive this board. Uh, in this case, I would just simply ground this E2. So and how I hook to it, I would just simply you know, jumper this to ground. The board's always enabled that way. That's fine. Uh, because enable one is normally high, there'll be no active outputs here. So really, all I need is eight control signals or a single byte to control this. And I'm guessing this is pretty much how it was designed to be used. Whatever device it plugged into, I'm guessing each one of these just simply used a byte to control it. That byte could be memory mapped, like if we had a microcontroller, it could be memory mapped, it could be on a port. It just doesn't matter. Anything that can manipulate eight bits, well, if it was memory mapped, it would need latches out here to drive it. So I'd probably do it with a port, with a port driver that latches. But on the pick, I can designate eight pins as output. And just simply through the bit manipulation here, control it. I, I will call this a write cycle. So if I wanted to put a value across all six of these. I would have all zeros here for this position, the BCD value. These three steps happen. One to zero to one, latch is there. The next BCD value, zero, zero, one. Another complete write cycle. And I would just walk through that for each one of the displays. The other nice thing about this is once these are latched, it's gonna hold the value. You don't need to do anything else on the microprocessor or the, or the controller. It's latched, the board becomes static at that point. So literally as a clock, you would simply need to do a write to this really once a second, every time the second changed. Uh, personally, I just do a full write cycle every time the seconds changed each one of the positions. That would be the easiest to code. That really general, or it lends itself nicely to being you know, maybe in a microcontroller and you have an interrupt occurring off an RTCC, you know, once a second. And every time that interrupt occurs, you just write the new time and you forget. You now have a full second of processing time in that microcontroller to do whatever the actual application is. So, uh, kind of a neat little board. Uh, I hope kind of observing my process here for reverse engineering something you know, like this was useful, uh, kind of getting my thought process. This is a pretty simple board, which makes reverse engineering something like this pretty, honestly, straightforward to do with a bit of thought and planning. I'm going to emphasize again that I did do a lot of planning up front. Studied the board. Where's the power? Where's the grounds? Why is there a jumper block here? What can I deduce from that? The displays don't have common pins across all the displays. They're not. That's not multiplexed. There seems to be a driver stack for every one. Turns out there's resistors here. There's a BCD decoder driver, current limiting resistors, and display. So a whole lot of information there without even looking really deeper into the board. Part numbers. The data sheets in this case. Looking a bit at the data sheets to understand what the devices did. From there, creating a plan to be able to actually reverse engineer the schematic out from, which I've done here. Uh, understanding, you know, the active state of the logics, the E1 and the E2 here are active low signals. So 
and E3 is an active high, so pulling E3 to plus 5, you know, one of the enable pins is already in the correct enable state. Uh, realizing there's a bulk select here. So from that, you know, tying that to ground, uh, that, that'll be enabled. But it was, you know, it was thinking this through, Re, you know, and realizing the fact that the seven LED driver outputs here go to resistor package, go to the LED, didn't need to be drawn in. It would just overcomplicate this, and, and you know that to be the truth. I didn't draw in the power rails. It's a five volt board. It would just add clutter here. We know that in TTL logic, typically the highest number pin is VCC. It's not always true, but it's typical. So we can just assume that pin 16 is hooked to pin 20 here. And what is it? Pin 16 here, here, and here, and then the grounds to pin 8s, to pin 8, to pin 10. We can you know, make that assumption, and it's a safe assumption. Uh, you know, uh, nice little kind of straightforward design. You know, it's pretty common design here. There's probably 0.1 microfarad decoupling capacitors here. One on all of the devices except for one, which is plenty of decoupling. There's kind of a bulk uh, decoupling cap here. It's an electrolytic, I'm sure, of some value. I can't really see the value on it. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention here, I don't think I hit in this video, are date codes, 18th week of 1976 on that capacitor. So this is a pretty old board. What's that make it, 42 years old? This is a 42 year old board. Uh, trying to read other date codes. I, don't, I have the long glasses on so I can't see. This is 27th week of 1976. 46th week of 76, 52nd week of 76. This date code is simply 652, but based on the others, we know that's 52nd week of 76. So this board was manufactured late 76, early 77. It's serial number 361, which is interesting. Uh, but you know, that's a 40 year old piece of electronics that's probably, besides testing, never seen power in its lifespan. There are kind of some markings in the edge connector here where I'm sure it was connected to to test. They're not heavily worn. I'm not seeing any real indication that there's been a, 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 an edge connector slid on, although I'm sure there was probably during testing. Uh, these are solder covered, so they're a little easier to mar up. But you know, I mean, that's amazing to me. 41, 42 year old board. I'm confident it'll probably work. I'm really intrigued by the fact, maybe you can see this here in the light pipes on the seven segment displays. As they rotate, that they are not uniform. This guy's kind of white and foggy. These are dark. This isn't nearly as dark. No part numbers on these is interesting. Uh, like there may be engineering samples or internal production only, maybe. Uh, I have to say the build quality on those doesn't seem great. This board suffers from the same thing. The light pipes, you know, some of them are shiny, some are dull, some are gray, some are whitish. This is board 93. Hmm. Take a look at the other two I've got here. Probably need to be ending this video. I've been droning on for quite a long time here. This is board 367. Well, on this one, the light pipes are actually raised up above the plastic. They're not even flush. Same there. Those are fairly flush. And the last one here. If I can get it out of the bag. Oh, Rosie, you hear you back there doing your little choking thing. is serial number 406. So we can assume there was at least 406 of these made. I don't know what they were made for. 
comes from the National Semiconductor Microcomputer Systems. That's also intriguing to me, making makes me think these may have been some kind of displays. Some kind of a microcomputer. They are decimal displays. They are not hexadecimal displays. That board's pretty warped, probably from just the way it's been stored. Anyhow, I hope you found this somewhat educational, somewhat entertaining. I look forward to feedback. I've had a bit of feedback. This top-down kind of shooting method I've come up with here it is working for at least some people. And I will end this and get it edited and posted. So we'll talk soon.